It's all about the sweet science this week as a champion returns home. Bam Bam will defend his title for the first time. Supposedly this guy is gonna take me out. And after more than a year, the Punisher is back in the ring. Yeah, I'm getting for a good treat. This is Fight Network's preview show. Hi, I'm Sarah Davis and welcome to Fight Network's preview show. There's a lot of boxing going on this weekend, so we'll have Corey Erdman join me shortly to break down the major matchups. We're starting off with a look at Canadian boxer Lucien Boutet will be defending his IBF super middleweight title when he takes on Jean-Paul Mendy at the Rome Expo in Bucharest, Romania. When IBF super middleweight champion Lucien Boutet meets Jean-Paul Mendy in the ring, both Southpaws will be looking to keep their undefeated records in check. Boutte is coming off a knockout over Brian McGee, which was his fifth consecutive stoppage. While Mendy won his last bout after Sakio Bika was disqualified for knocking Mendy out when he was down on his knees. Undefeated IBF super middleweight champion Lucien Boutte defends his title for the eighth time against undefeated French warrior Jean-Paul Mendy. Boutte comes into this fight untested by any boxer who has stood in front of him. With very advanced skills and a great ring IQ, he has outclassed all of his recent opponents. In his last fight, he fought hard-punching aggressive fighter Brian McGee and stopped him by TKO in the 10th round. That is it! He goes down for the third time on a body shot, and Boutte is the winner. Boutte is a fighter that has slid under the radar for the last couple of years, and although he is often underrated, he continues to prove his worth. He is slightly larger than your average super middleweight and uses his size to his advantage. Boutte also possesses great speed and agility and breaks his opponents down methodically. One of his key weapons are his body shots, which he uses effectively to both slow down and inevitably stop his opponents. Mendy will have to be very weary when attacking the slick Canadian, otherwise he will get caught by a punch that could deal him his first loss inside of the squared circle. Boutte is driven on by competition, and should he secure a victory against Mendy, the boxing world will be forced to give Boutte a shot against the division's elite. Looking for bigger and badder challenges, Boutte has his sights set on unifying the super middleweight titles. If he has a spectacular performance against Mendy, he will be catapulted into the higher profile fights against the likes of Andre Ward, Carl Froch, or ring legend Bernard Hopkins. On July the 9th, the IBF super middleweight champion will once again return to his native Romania as he prepares to defend the gold. Corey Erdman, our boxing analyst, joins me now. Corey, let's get down to it. These two fighters, they have similar records, but Lucien Boutte has a higher KO ratio. So how do their styles match up? Well, they're both southpaws, so they visually look similar, but Jean-Paul Mendy is more of a lefty spoiler, whereas Lucien Boutte is a southpaw as well, but he's a precise power puncher. And Mendy is really in this fight by accident. He got knocked out by Saki Obika. Just so happened that Bika hit him after the bell. So by accident, he winds up here with a title shot. He doesn't handle power very well. And Lucien Boutte has plenty of it. This isn't a very good style matchup for Jean-Paul Mendy. If Boutte does go on to win, which it sounds like he's favored to, what will be next for him? Well, we're looking at Boutte versus the winner of the Super 6 World Boxing Classic. So that either being Andre Ward or Carl Frosch. But there is time in between. We were hoping to see Boutte versus Mikkel Kessler, but Kessler's now signed on to fight Robert Stieglitz. So we might even see something in the middle. The ultimate goal for Lucien Boutte is for him to face Bernard Hopkins. And that's who Bernard Hopkins wants to face to end his career. So there's a lot of gold at the end of the rainbow for Lucien Boutte. We just don't know what's in the middle. For Mendy, it seems that this is the most significant fight of his career and toughest opponent. Would you agree? Yeah, th there's no question. I mean, the, the best names on Jean-Paul Mendy's resume, Anthony Hanshaw, and a guy by the name of Sugar Poo, nice. Henry, Henry nice. Buchanan. So not much, <laughs> not saying much for Jean-Paul Mendy. He's really going to be outclassed, I believe, by Lucien Boutte. And that is your prediction, correct? Yeah, I would say Boutte KO in six uh, or less. In Carson, California, Brandon Bam Bam Rios will defend his WBA lightweight title when he takes on Urbano Antelon. With a record of 27 wins and one draw, this will be Rios' first title defense. Antelon, who has 28 victories and two losses, is coming off a unanimous decision defeat to Umberto Soto last December for the WBC lightweight title, but now gets a second chance to capture gold. Supposedly this guy is gonna take me out. It's third time fighting for a title. That's never gonna happen again. After after July 9th, I'm gonna knock him out. And I'm gonna show the world why I am the best at 135 and why I'm the man. And that's why I became a champion. The war of words has begun and the young champion Brandon Rios has been busy using mind games to distract the challenger. 
The older fighter, Urbano Antelon, has kept his cards very close to his chest, not revealing much about the plans inside of the ring. We were supposed to fight back, back in May, but, you know, luckily for him, he got cut a week before the fight, so... Lucky. Exactly. Just practice your defense, bro, and don't get cut again. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> practice my defense. We need a translator here, please. Uh, sorry. <laughs> practice your fucking defense, and uh, maybe you understand that. Cause it's better. That's, it's better. See, like, it's the only word you understand. It's <laughs> If this fight lives up to all of the hype that Rios has created, the boxing world could be in store for another heated rivalry. The confident undefeated champion Rios has been feeding off the buzz that he has created. In the lightweight division, Rios is not the most accomplished champion. Having a great performance could open him up to possible fights with the division's other champions, such as Juan Manuel Marquez, Robert Guerrero, and Humberto Soto. Antelon has lost two of his last four fights, but had a great performance against Soto, which showed the world that he is indeed a worthy adversary. Verbally abusing his opponent throughout their press tour, Rios has assumed the role of the villain. July 9th, you're going to get more than a knockout. Your ass is going to end. Your career is going to be done. You're never going to fight for a title again. At only 25 years of age, can Rios keep this up throughout his career? Or is this a marketing scheme to make the fight more interesting for casual fans? Ask me that question. If a coaster wasn't a test, why did he knock you out? And why did I knock him out? Because you're the man, bro. You're the man. Thank you. One more time. Exactly. The supremely confident Rios has recently been training with Antonio Margarito and has acquired a strength and conditioning coach, which will prove to be an important factor due to the very aggressive style shared by the two fighters. Previous fights have proven that these two warriors are capable of standing and trading punches in the middle of the ring. I just show, I'm just going to show everybody July 9th that this guy next to me, this is the last time, this is the last time he's going to fight for a title, this is the last time he's going to fight again. Rios will have a lot to prove to his fans as he must deliver on all the hype that he has created. With more than just a title at stake, Rios will have to put up or shut up on Saturday night as Antelon looks to take the belt from the cocky champion. I'm going to shut up July 9th. I'm still talking right now. I ain't going to shut up. You see, me, you see me shutting up? I'm not shutting up. Exactly. Exactly. Corey, a lot of trash talking usually goes on before these matchups, and Brandon Rios seems to be one of the best at it, getting into the minds of his opponents. Do you think he ever crosses the line? In the real world, Sarah, you can't use homophobic slurs. You can't make fun of people's medical ailments. In fact, you'd either be arrested or sent to the HR department. But within boxing, these things, they're acceptable. Brandon Rios will say absolutely anything to get into his opponent's head. And to be fair, it sells fights. We're talking about this fight right now, and people pay attention when Brandon Rios talks. So you kind of have to let it slide. Do you think this is going to affect Urbano Antelon? Antion seems to do his thing no matter what. He's going to bring pressure, and he seems pretty jovial about all this. Brandon Rios has said some outlandish things at the press conferences leading up to this Saturday's fight, and Antion just sort of smiles and nods. So I don't think it's getting to him too much. I think that Brandon Rios' physical pressure in the ring might get to him, though. For Antion, the only two opponents he's ever lost to is Miguel Acosta and Umberto Soto, so this must say something about his toughness as well. Absolutely, but... The one thing we have to mention is that he was knocked out by Acosta, who Brandon Rios knocked out. So if you're looking to compare opponents, Rios is the decided favorite in this one, and Rios has more power than Acosta. The one thing also is that Antion wasn't able to stop Soto with all those punches that he throws. You have to be concerned about how much power he has, and Rios is just a gigantic lightweight, and I don't know if he's going to be able to hurt Brandon Rios. And who's going to win it? What's your prediction? I'm going to say that this is going to be a heck of a fight, maybe a fight of the year candidate, but I think that Rio stops Antion in seven rounds. In Atlantic City, New Jersey, former two-time WBO welterweight champion Paul the Punisher Williams will trade fists with Cuba's heiress Landy Lara. Williams suffered only the second loss of his career in his last bout when Sergio Martinez knocked him out. While Lara, who has yet to lose a fight, has earned a record of 15 victories and one draw. Paul Williams is getting ready to face competition for the first time since he was knocked out by Sergio Martinez. Williams will be taking on up-and-comer Eros Landi Lara in Lara's 17th professional bout. Paul the Punisher Williams is a boxer that has widely been regarded as one of the top pound-for-pound -pound fighters in the sport. This fight will be used as a tune-up for Williams, who has been out of the ring for over a year since suffering his last defeat. He has faced tough competitors such as Antonio Margarito, Winky Wright, Kermit Citron, and Sergio Martinez, winning the first and losing their second bout. In what was one of the best fights of 09, the Punisher squared off against Martinez and showed the world that he could trade punches with the division's elite. In his second fight with Martinez, Williams was floored in stunning fashion with a punch that was hailed knockout of the year. Good left hand, and down goes right. Williams! 
think it was a right hook. Right hand. Williams through the left. Williams down. Williams has not been in the ring since his loss to Martinez, and according to Williams' camp, he has both mentally and physically recovered. Williams' fighting style is very adaptable. He can fight on the outside using his long reach to keep other fighters at the end of his punches, or he can stand on the inside as he did against Martinez and Antonio Margarito. And there's a straight left hand that lands for Williams, and a sweeping left hand that lands for Williams. Now he snaps Margarito's head back with a straight left hand. The Punisher uses his range firing jabs and straight right hands from a distance, and on the inside he uses his hooks and uppercuts to get the job done. As long as Williams leads with his jab, look at the length on that jab, that Reed Richards comparison. Is really accurate. Williams does possess power in his hands and has proven that he can take a solid punch. The Punisher's movement has proven to be very slippery and he often proves a hard target to hit. It is a big left by Williams. And now Martinez fires three more right hooks and clocks Williams with a left. And Williams fires back. And they're trading shots. What a savage exchange in the middle of the ring. Amazing. On July the 9th, the boxing world will once again get a chance to watch the Punisher in action. His upcoming bout against the young fighter Lara will show whether or not Williams has fully recovered if he is indeed the same boxer the world once adored. Corey, starting off, is Paul Williams going to have a hard time shaking off that devastating knockout in his last fight with Sergio Martinez? You never know how fighters are going to react after something as devastating as that. But we have seen fighters at 154 pounds come back from devastating knockouts. Guys like Terry Norris were able to shake it off and come back and dominate the division. But there's a reason that they chose Arislandi Lara for this matchup, and it's because they're minimizing the chances of him getting that chin cracked again. Lara is not a devastating puncher at 154 pounds, so it's a little bit of a safe matchup for the Punisher. Williams is the better known fighter, and he's known for his long range, good movement, powerful hands. Is Arislandi Lara gonna be able to handle him as an inexperienced fighter? Well, the one thing about Paul Williams that even though he throws a lot of punches, a lot of them are wide and looping. And a quick little guy like Lara who throws straight punches with a good amateur pedigree might be able to get inside some of those punches. But the one time that we've seen Erislandi Lara pressured was against Carlos Molina, and he wilted. And Carlos Molina is not Paul Williams. He doesn't throw that many punches. So it's going to be tough to predict that Lara is going to be able to handle a guy like Williams who's going to throw 100 punches per round. Well, we never like to see wilting in the ring. How important is this fight for each boxer? And will the winner go on to be a contender with Saul Canelo Alvarez? Yeah, I, I think down the road that's a great possibility. I think that that's one of the dream matchups at 154, I guess either of these guys and Canelo Alvarez. But if Paul Williams loses this fight, forget about him as a player on HBO. For Lara, if he loses this fight, you can forget about him as a player on anywhere except ESPN2. But okay. if they win, Absolutely, there are big money fights for both of these guys. I think that Lara is a little less likely to get that fight because he doesn't have the name value that Paul Williams does, so it's not as profitable for Golden Boy, but definitely it's do or die for both of these guys in this matchup. And how do you think this matchup will end? I think a unanimous decision for Paul Williams. I think that Lara is smart enough and durable enough to stay on his feet, but I think that Paul Williams is gonna pound him out over 12 rounds. After the break, we'll hear from first generation Carlson Gracie student, Marcus Soros. Now John Ramdeen is bringing us a closer look at the growth of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu across Canada. He recently caught up with BJJ master Marcus Soares. Recently the Burlington Academy of Martial Arts has brought a number of world-class fighters and trainers to their school for the benefit of both the instructors and students. Carlson Gracie, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu representative and one of Canada's first BJJ black belts, Marcus Soares stopped by the academy to teach students some of the finer points of the gentle art. Soares, who came to Canada for the first time in 1997, has seen the growth of the sport from coast to coast and credits the press and mixed martial arts' biggest brand for the exposure. Uh, with the help of the media, when UFC started to do these reality shows and all this stuff, the interest of the general public got much bigger, you know. So now we have many, many schools all over the country and many students interested to learn the art of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. 
Bama owner Clint Sanguebaum feels blessed that a teacher the level of Soares can bring patience, understanding and history to all of his students. I know his coaching style is extremely, um, it, it, it's, it's a coaching style that allows a student to really understand in layman terms what he's trying to get across. Sometimes they'll show you a move and expect you to do it, but he can go in there and fine tune the move, show you every detail, and whatever challenges you, you have, he makes your challenges benefit the technique. So he's able to give you the technique and tweak it so that it works extremely well for you and still remains extremely technical. The seventh degree black belt Soros is dedicated to spreading the teachings of his mentor and is less concerned with building his own brand. I don't care uh, too much about my name, you know, I was Carson Grace student, I founded the Carson Grace team Canada, even now my master Carson passed away in 2006, uh, I'm still very proud to represent his team, you know, and I believe all my representatives too, you know, so my name is not important to like Carson Grace's name. The master is constantly learning and honing his arsenal for the development of the sport of Gracie Jiu-Jitsu and the entire grappling community. When I'm not teaching Jiu-Jitsu, I'm studying Jiu-Jitsu to develop new techniques, new way how to set it up the, the techniques to be successful in the fight, right? So when I travel to do my seminars, first of all, I like to update the students with the new techniques that I develop, right? And second, to try to answer and show the small details of every single question they ask me. I like to give the freedom to the students. They ask whatever they want and try. They have a better understanding of the techniques, about points of leverage, space, everything you need to know to to do well the technique. Stay with us after the break as we'll be previewing TNA's annual Destination X event. This segment on the Fight Network is brought to you by The Ballroom, downtown Toronto's newest interactive entertainment centre. Destination X is set for this Sunday in Orlando, Florida, and not only are some of TNA's best X Division wrestlers rumored to be coming back, but the promotion's also bringing back the six-sided ring. John Pollock has all the details. In June of 2002, TNA Wrestling launched as a national promotion presenting weekly pay-per-views in an attempt to grab the disenfranchised wrestling fan who had seen both World Championship Wrestling and Extreme Championship Wrestling fold. Fans wanted an alternative. The double leg takedown. The TNA quickly found a niche with what would become the X Division, featuring top talent from across North America who were getting their first national exposure and presenting an in-ring product that set TNA apart in their formative years. Through the talents of AJ Styles, Christopher Daniels, Loki, Jerry Lynn, and later Samoa Joe, the X Division was the promotion's staple. I think it's very important for the X Division to have their own pay-per-view destination X, uh, just because it kind of shows that the X Division is one of the strongest points in TNA, um, one of the focal points of the company, and it's a real platform for everybody to show their skills on. They get to be the main events. They get to be the matches that are talked about. Everything that happens in those matches is just so much high risk, and professional wrestling Wrestling is so high risk as it is, they just take it to another level. With so many great athletes, it's time for the X Division to take center stage. On July 10th, TNA will set out with an X Division themed pay per view entitled Destination X, headlined by two of the pillars from the growth period, AJ Styles and Christopher Daniels. I think AJ Styles versus Christopher Daniels is the match to see at Destination X. Not just because we were one of the first matches that caught the world's attention. We were the first two guys that started the buzz about TNA and Impact Wrestling. The two have competed in some of the most memorable TNA matches in history and will look to reaffirm the X Division, which has fallen by the wayside in prior years. This is the match you're gonna wanna see at Destination X. Why? Because I've wrestled Chris, God knows how many times Chris has wrestled me, God knows how many times there's gonna be all kinds of things that are gonna happen that, you know, we're gonna have to outsmart each other and that's not an easy thing to do. The event will also look to recapture ECW fans by putting together a singles bout between Rob Van Dam and Jerry Lynn, one of the most popular feuds in ECW history. These matches 
RVD versus Jerry Lynn, that was X Division before there was an X Division because the inspiration from those matches totally motivated what you're seeing today and what you've seen since then in pro wrestling, and particularly with these guys that go out there in the X Division and do all the high flying and, and, and they're showing off. That's what those matches are about. That's what my whole career has been about. Destination X will also see Samoa Joe take on Frankie Kazarian, two products of the Southern California scene, and both are expected to bring out the best of each his ability. Joe was the flag bearer for the X Division from 2005 through 2006, having memorable matches with Styles and Daniels, with the three headlining the TNA Unbreakable pay-per-view in September of 2005. From an in-ring standpoint, this looks to be the standout show of the year for TNA and a much-needed focus placed back on the X Division, which led to casual fans becoming fans of the product during their early years. This is the paper that's going to highlight all, all that's great in this company. It's guys who are willing to go uh, above and beyond the Call of Duty to get the win, to get the victory. They'll do whatever it takes. Destination X, it's, it's just the most exciting pay-per-view that you could ever watch. That is one of the pay-per-views where everybody, including the crowd, is biting their nails. The athletes that we have, they always seem to step up another level. They always seem to pull out extra moves that they've never done before. You know, there's something for everybody at Destination X if you're a fan of the X Division. Number one, the six-sided ring returns, and I know a lot of people are gonna be happy about that. But then how about the debuts and how about the returns? Going to be a lot of new X Division competitors that will make their first matches, their debut matches at Destination X. And from what I hear, going to be some very interesting returns as well. Some former X Division competitors who return at Destination X. Destination X is this Sunday night from the Impact Zone in Orlando, Florida. That's all for the show. Don't forget, you can always visit our website, fightnetwork.com, for the latest combat news. And you can also tweet us on Twitter. Our handle is at FightNet. On behalf of the Fight Network, I'd like to thank the Ballroom for letting us use their space. And thank you for watching. We'll catch you next time.